wonderful worship. I always look forward to singing. It's, uh, it's wonderful. The sermon I've sort of uh, chosen to speak on today is about the Christ, the incredible name and identity of Jesus. So um, as a kid, I sort of grew up, you know, in Jesus Christ and YES class. We talked about it. And, uh, but then I thought that Christ was just his last name, like Jesus Christ, right? But uh, I want to present to you, you know, the identity, uh, the incredible name of Christ, the Christ. And uh, we'll, we'll go through that. First of all, I'd like to share or, or walk through a couple of scriptures. We'll do some like kind of scripture reading. Um, I know in other churches this is normal that someone would get up and do a lectionary or readings and then they do the sermon. Um, so I thought I would, you know, give the scripture at the beginning here. And it's uh, found in three passages, the first being in Exodus 1, 8 uh, through 20, uh, 10, the story of Moses. And I think you can read along. I... Uh, Remember preparing this sermon, I was told to break the font size, the age of the fellowship. So I'm 44, so I put it as 48, but I think if you put it as 80, you probably better. Anyway, so I hope you guys can read that and follow along. Um, now a king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase. In the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built city, uh, supply cities, Pithom and Ramsey by Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites. And many of their lives bitter and hard service and mortar and brick and every kind of field labor. They are ruthless in all tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of, you, uh, one of whom was named uh, Shepharian and the other in Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them in their birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him, but if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them. They let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to the Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwives come to them. So God dealt with the midwives and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service and brick and mortar. They are ruthless when all tasks opposed on them. Then Pharaoh commanded, every, All that is people, every boy that is born to the Hebrew, you shall throw into the Nile, but every girl shall live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, I find that kind of comical, fine baby, she hid him from the three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and placed it in him uh, with bitumen and pitch, and he put the child in and placed it among the reeds on the river bank. His sister stood at him at a distance to know what would happen with him. I, I find that, you know, you leave a baby kind of going in a, in a river or something, and well, at least they were looking to see that somebody would take care of them. Good. The, Pharaoh, uh, the daughter of Pharaoh came down to the bay of the river while her attendants beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw a child. He was crying, and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, he, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get your nurse from the Hebrew woman to nurse your child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wage. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, she took him as her son. She named him Moses because... She said, I drew him out of the water. Our next scripture is in Romans 12, 1 through 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, 
by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good and acceptable and perfect. And our last scripture comes in Matthew uh, 16, 13 through 20. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Carpheus Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and some say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. I said to them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, said, Blessed you are, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter on this rock. I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Then he sternly uh, ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. So we see that we got three scriptures there. And it's part of a, a liturgy, I guess, a package or whatever it will. And, uh, you know, as you go along through the year, like there's, you know, certain liturgies. And Bob's spoken a little bit from it. And, uh, you know, we've, I, at the conference, I spoke to some pastors, and, you know, some of them are using it, and some of them do more topical studies and stuff. But today I chose, I thought I would go with the liturgy and, and sort of see, you know, what uh, those three scriptures and how they're kind of bound together and, and, and talk about our identity. Now, I'd like for you to do something right now. Today, well, so today I want to talk about identity. So God created us all unique with our own identities, our own talents, abilities. Each of us are unique. You know, we've created no two snowflakes are alike, no two sand, and none of us are all the same. We're all quite unique. I mentioned last time we spoke about Kathy Dedo shared about our special identity and relationship with God. Today I want to take a look at one identity expressed in Jesus the Christ. But before I do that, I'd like for us to try and take a look at ourselves and our identity. So I want you to uh, pull out a piece of paper if you are taking notes. If not, I've tried to figure out how I was going to do this. Um, with your dominant hand, which most of you are right-handed, right? Um, and if you're not taking notes, don't have a pen and paper, maybe try and, you know, as, as you, you write down, you know, thoughts of who you're, what your identity is, just physically kind of write it out in, in midair or something. Just, just go along with it. We'll see how we go here. So uh, take out a piece of paper and basically write down, I'll give you a couple minutes, in, with your dominant hand, and really I think it's actually right hands, I think this would kind of go because people are logical with their left hand or right left-handed or creative, whatever it is. So I'll give you a couple minutes. So just go ahead and write down um, some piece of identity, what you think would identify who you are. I'll give you a few moments there. So at this pace, the sermon will be more than 10 minutes. <laughs> uh. All right, so giving you guys an idea anyway that, um, you know, with your right hand. And for me, this is difficult because I'm left-handed, so this, this whole thing doesn't work, no. But I wrote down, you know, I'm a man, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a report developer, soccer coach, pastor. I wrote down my full name, Mark Gordy Kaberski. Um, after the first minute, I wrote down my age, my height, my proximate weight, my hair color, my, you know, my eye color. You write all these things, right? Now, what I'd like you to do is take the, the opposite hand, which most people, your non-dominant would be left-handed, and write down some more words about yourself, your identity. So I'll go ahead and, you know, write in midair or think about what you're in your non-dominant hand. And I might have to give you more than 30 seconds on this one, because you might be able to write out one word, like... The. <laughs> yep. Then your uh, 
your, your, your notes will be graded after. No, I'm kidding. For those of you typing your answers, it's difficult because there is no dominant or non-dominant, right? I'd love to walk around and see, see your guys' work. Non, like, because right-handed people really don't use their left hand at all. So anyway, I mean, you can do this at home or whatever, but what, what most people write, obviously, could be something different because you're using different parts of your brain. And, and, and I'll get to why we're doing this in a second here. But when I wrote this down, I wrote things like, I'm creative, I like people, I like to doodle, uh, I like to draw, I like to sing, I love music, I want everyone to have fun. I really do. I want all you all to be enjoying yourself. Um, I'm compassionate. Um, I'm patient. Uh, I'm a mama's boy. I wrote that down. Yeah, I am. So there's two sort of sides to a person's identity, right? You can think about, well, with the dominant hand, you might write down what's more logical, like how do you explain people. And with the left hand, you might you know, find this, what's creative and not necessarily labels, but who that person is, right? Now, if, uh, if I were a bad guy and the police put on a most wanted poster, right, to look for Mark, right, what would they describe me as, right? I'm six foot two. Uh, brown hair, brown eyes, blue eyes, a hint of gray here, and apparently one back here, which is like I had a bad painting accident or something, and a white, uh, a white half, like half white eyebrow, which is really funny. So, um, and about 190 pounds. Maybe they won't write that on the poster, right? And then he likes to hang around Starbucks stores and Apple store. He drives a Chevy Traverse, loves to listen to music, is often carrying a yoga mat during work hours. Uh, to go yoga, always has his iPhone out, you know, making photo videos of his son. Um, friends with most people, uh, has a large crowd of Filipino family and friends that he hangs out with, loves coffee, uh, and prefers the dark blend, right, Gene? <laughs> and Americano being his favorite drink, right? For the sake of, you know, the app, uh, apprehension of this person, like myself, the police are not interested in the character of the person, right? They're not interested in the compassion, kindness, musical abilities, artistic expression, uh, whether someone is a, you know, a parent or, or a good parent or a faithful friend. Not really looking for that, right? They're interested in the outward things. How do you, you, know, how do you characterize Mark? You, know, you want to go find him. How do you characterize that? But isn't the real person that's less about what you look like and more what you are, like what your role is and who you are, right? The inner person, your qualities, your personality, your character, your beliefs, your ethics, your morals, uh, the actual person that, you know, lives inside your character. Uh, now, when, uh, this is kind of interesting, but at sort of the end of your life or something, when a pastor visits your house, right, and they arrange a funeral for you or someone, right, that loved one, they're often asked to tell about stories about that person because they want to do a eulogy or a presentation or something or talk about them or, you know, something for the funeral, um, they, they hear the names, the date, the title, the roles, and stuff like that. Um, and then they're also, you know, want you to describe a bit of your character, right? The character and personality traits of who you are. But those come out in actions, right? So someone who is kind is often seen as doing things that are kind, to kind to people, right? Someone is loving because they do things that are loving. They go out and they love people, right? What they're looking for, in essence, is the real person, right? They're not looking that you were a parent, but what kind of parent were you? Or you were a spouse, but what kind of spouse were you? What were you like to people, right? I reflect on, you know, like if I thought of describing my mom, you know, I said, well, yeah, well, she's Florette Kaberski. She was, you know, whatever, born and such. And such. But I think, no, my mom, Florette Kaberski, many people would say, was like a beautiful flower. Uh, very, uh, she was ever faithful, always faithful, and could always be counted on for anything. So you sort of see where I'm getting at, with the true identity, right? And there's obviously some other examples. Um, through the embarrassment of Gene, I might say, well, Gene, he's a retired coffee dude. You know, we go out and stuff. But there's more to that. Gene has got, you know, deeply grounded faith. Uh, he, he's got very interesting ideas that we talk about and we wrestle with. Very spirit-filled and, you know, he, he's committed. And Gene's like, 
quit playing, you know, quit, you know. But, you know, we, you sort of get what you're getting at, right? You can look at someone's appearance and say, well, that's what they're doing. But it's like, no, inside, what's their identity? Now, if we go to the next slide, um, I got a picture of a, a spaceship, right? Today's gospel sums up uh, pretty concisely. What do these people say the Son of Man is? You know, we see that in, uh, who is Jesus? What is Jesus? Now, suppose a, a spaceship came out uh, from, and landed on Earth, and some aliens from another planet popped out, uh, and they found us, that they were Christians, and they asked, you know, who is this Jesus guy, right? Tell me about him. What would we say? And I believe we would say things like, Jesus is God, uh, Jesus is the Son of God, or sorry, Jesus is God, Jesus is the Son of God, Jesus was born in a stable to Mary, uh, Jesus was born of a virgin, uh, Jesus performed miracles, Jesus died on a cross, Jesus was resurrected. You know, we'd say all these facts, right? But notice, some, none of these things say about the character of Jesus, right? Who was Jesus in essence, his personality, his character, his spirituality, uh, what he thought, he acted towards each other. Who is this Jesus guy, right? And when we said, see, in, uh, when we talked in the beginning there with the scriptures in Matthew saying, who do people say the Son of Man is when he asked his disciples, right? Now, there's two concepts here, the Son of Man and then the Son of God. So there's two terms. We're going to go look at the Son of Man in terms of what did Jesus refer to him when he said that, right? It doesn't simply mean a human, like the Son of Human. It comes from a passage in Scripture in Daniel where we talk about the various beasts, right? The beasts are empires that gobble up and destroy things. They are called the beasts because they're violent and they kill and basically rape and plunder the land. And the ordinary people make, uh, make off money off of the ordinary people. One could argue that most of the empires we see in the world, the British Empire, the American Empire, the German Empire, uh, Greek Empire, Roman, Mongolian, uh, Syrian, all of these empires uh, go on to control and dominate using you know, violence at times to take you know, ordinary people so that they can have power and be wealthy. You can sort of see that in history we see that, right? But up on the throne of God comes the Son of Man which represents a frail human, right? Born with another vision for humanity. And the Son of Man is given the kingdom that will last forever. Jesus here is the new man with the new vision of humanity. And I remember back in college when we talked about the Son of Man and then the Son of God and stuff. I thought, what an interesting comment. Son of Man, what does that mean? And that's probably what it's referring to here. It's like he's come to establish, you know, what new humanity, the new vision of what we were supposed to be and the, the, the new vision of humanity. Now, the second word or concept is the Christ. Um, not the second name of Jesus, but Jesus the Christ, right? So in the Greek, uh, I think it says, in, 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 celo, in, celo, in celsius Christo, meaning Jesus the Christ, right? With that article the in there, right? But since it's two words in the English language, we put them together, Jesus Christ. It's, it's easier, right? But literally it means Jesus the Christ, right? And the Christ in the Greek word means, in the Jewish, or sorry, the Greek word in the Jewish means Messiah, means anointed one, right? Which is the kind of like the special one of God. And the Jews all knew that Messiah was supposed to be about. He was supposed to be God's anointed one, one that would come and destroy the Romans and overthrow the oppressors and usher in a new world of peace, era, and justice, right? And Jesus, in the same effect, said, yeah, I am the guy. I am the anointed one. I am the Messiah. Uh, but guess what? It wasn't the Messiah they were looking for, right? It wasn't the physically Messiah they, they were expecting for. It was something different. And so we see just as these passages talk about Jesus as the Christ, we might be left in the dark of what it really means to be Messiah or Christ. But we have four Gospels in particular to see how Jesus was, the Christ. You know, we walk and we step through the Gospels. Um, and I mentioned here, like in YES, you know, we used to write, you know, God and then Jesus and stuff. And I thought Jesus was Jesus Christ as a kid. And I didn't know anything about this title. Uh, but now let's explore what it means to be the Christ. The Confession of Peter is made in uh, Kazira, Philippi. It's the headquarters for the Romans in that area. Uh, this placed the name at Caesar. In those days, a common confession was that Caesar was Lord. The Caesar was the Son of God. So back then, right? 
And by having that confession on the capital of the Roman occupation, Jesus, the Son of Man, was saying that his way of humanity was not a way of power of Lord or not of Caesar. It was different. All the empires that rape and pillage and take advantage and gather money and material things is not of the Lord. So we're kind of contrasting, you know, this idea of Caesar being, you know, son of God or God, you know, and then Lord and son of man, sort of saying that. So Jesus is Lord is another way. It's the way of son of man and the way of Christ. And the way of love, nonviolence, tenderness, forgiveness, equality, and justice. Now, we don't get that in the topic of, uh, you know, in Philippi there. We have to read the Gospels to learn about that. Uh, but he does go on to predict that he'd be suffered and crucified, you know, and all this stuff. So that's interesting. So we go to the next slide, then we'll talk and look at what does it mean to be called Jesus the Christ? And we'll go through quite a few points here. We stop and think of what it means to be Jesus Christ. It means that when you look uh, at the way Jesus is, the way he acts, the character of Jesus, you see how God is, uh, who, how God acts. You see the character of God. You know, you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? There's primarily a list of love and kindness and understanding and gentleness and compassion, right? When you look to Jesus, you see someone who go into the wilderness and who risk their life, you know, for a worthless lamb or one lamb, right? Uh, and maybe at points we are that lamb. We are that person that Jesus would go and rescue. When you look at Jesus, you see someone who would welcome home a good-for-nothing son. You know, somebody who squandered their family fortunes, living riotous living, right? And instead of judgment and condemnation, there's an extravagant welcome and a celebration of a son coming home. Now, maybe at points of our life, we are that good-for-nothing family member. And Jesus is extravagantly welcoming us. That's what it means to be the Christ. When you look at Jesus, you see that he's someone who would go out of his way to help his enemies and bind the wounds and tend and, and pay for his medical care. And maybe at points in our life, we are that enemy. We are kind of contrary to what God is doing, but Jesus is doing, but he still loves us, right? When we say that Jesus is the Christ, it means that nowhere we could go, nowhere uh, we can't be on this earth or anywhere, that Jesus will not want us and keep running after us and keep wanting to be with us. You know, he'll keep going into our lives, into these difficult parts of life. He wants to bury in. He wants to get into those shack areas of our life. And, you know, he wants to be there. Well, that's what it means, Jesus. When we saw Jesus to Christ, it means Jesus will love us so much that he'll go to the cross and die and, and yell out when he's being crucified that he loves humanity. I love them, you know. It means that even death cannot kill his love. And his love is so strong that it can survive death. When I call Jesus to Christ, it means that Jesus is not just a person, but the very power of love that can live in us and change and transform the world. So we can be like Jesus, who rose again from the dead. It means that we can die to selfishness, our self, and ego and violence, and be born again like Jesus. When I call Jesus to Christ, it means that Jesus tells us that the way of love the truth, love, the way to be, is the only way worth living and the way of life. Um, we look, keep watching the news and it seems, you know, like crazy. It's like a story of something out of a novel or something. And you talk to people at work and they're just, oh, I don't know what to think. I don't know how to feel. I don't know what to do and stuff. We have the opportunity to share truth. And I, I read a kind of an article on the internet, which is kind of oxymoron. You'll see where I'm going with this. About Google, right? You say, oh, did you read about such and such? Oh, I'll Google it, right? And then you get your just Google page, and you read it, and you go, okay, that's what Google thinks, and that's what I think. That's what the world thinks. Well, this article on Google, actually, the way they do search engines and stuff, it's all based on you know, money, whoever pays for the most, whatever's popular, and there's filtering going on in Google. Like in our open world, you know, it still happens. In China, no Google. They, they just get, you know, what happens. And in North Korea also, they have, you know, their doctrine and stuff like that. So we think that it's, you know, the World Wide Web and it's all the information of humanity. In actuality, they're, they're kind of positioning what we believe. And this will go on and it'll be more mucky, murky and stuff and false truths and fake news. And you're getting your news from Facebook and that's a bit tainted. You're getting it from Twitter, that's also... 
So you see where I'm going with this. When people stop and they think, well, what is true? Even we watch the news, you know, Gene and I talk about, you know, even the different newscasts and how biased they can be in different directions and stuff. Or articles, you know, people write things. Where is the truth? Obviously, it's in Scripture. You know, we, we know that. We have that. And it's, it's foundational. So when Jesus, the Christ, Jesus is truth, you know, that's where we can enter in and walk in and, and share with people that, hey, I got it. This is all confusing. This doesn't make any sense. I can give you something that's ironclad, something that will survive time. And the truth, you know, so we don't have to worry about fake news. When I call Jesus the Christ, it means that all emptiness inside, the hurt and the pain that people have caused, the scars, the wounds of rejection, the inner turmoil of sin and selfishness can be healed by love. And we become new creations. When I call Jesus to Christ, it means that Jesus lives in me and you and everywhere we, you know, we spread and have the Spirit. Wherever we care, wherever we reach out, wherever we stop and help people and talk to people, we're operating in this active world. You know, and we stop and think, you know, where is the kingdom? Everywhere we walk, everywhere we express, everywhere we, we are, and, and, you know, we share the truth and we share, you know, the, the rich, you know, thing that God has given us and, and the hope and stuff, we're sharing the kingdom. We're sharing this, this world to the, to the world that's, you know, contrary to that and often doesn't want it. But we're still a light. We still have the ability to be able to be lights to people. We call Jesus to Christ. It means we're building a part of the kingdom here on earth. And we're sharing. And, you know, we can be co-partners with God to other humans. When I call Jesus to Christ, the Son of God, it literally means that we're all loved and accepted by God. We are all God's children. Every last one of us, true identity is a child of God. Yes, we are the people that are lost, that don't know their identity yet. You know, when we go to people in the workplace or even our, our family and stuff, they don't know they're children of God. You know, we can express that. We can share that. That's their true identity. So when, I, when we stop and think about the identity, what we wrote down on our paper, right? And you figure out, okay, who I am and who I am internally. What am I, you know? Um, our mission is to go to people so they can help understand their identity. You know, as a child of God, somebody who you know, is designed to be with God, and to help to understand that and find that and, and to express that. Now, if we go to the next slide, we talk about the story of Moses and Jesus. You know, these two contrasting. So in this liturgy, they put these scriptures together. The Old Testament lesson paired with the gospel lesson. And you stop and think, well, how are those connected? What's going on there, right? Well, the story about Moses in the bulrush and Pharaoh had ordered all the Jewish babies, boys to kill. That was the evil empire, right? The beast is getting rid of all things that might threaten them, right? Well, that's, that's what empires do, right? That's, you know, you think of all the history and stuff like that. They go off and violently, they need to get their power. And, and even in today's society, you stop and look at all of our kingdoms. They're all established to stay in power. They want power. They want these things, right? But the midwives did not cooperate. Moses' mother didn't cooperate. Moses' sister didn't cooperate. Pharaoh's daughter didn't cooperate. And Moses was saved from the waters and gained a new identity as a prince. You know, he was obviously still Hebrew, but he became, you know, born somewhere else. Notice that all these actions and this drama uh, stood for, they, people stood up for them in love, for salvation. They risked their lives and stood up against the beast or the, you know, the, the kingdom who had a different version of humanity, who were nonviolent, were actually all women, which is kind of interesting. And although these women lived 1,400 years before Jesus, I believe the character they were showing was the character of Christ. They acted in such a way that they opposed evil and championed love and justice. Now someday, somebody will come to my door and say, no pastor will come to my house and say, planning Mark's funeral, right? And they're going to say, well, what was he or she like? What was Mark like, right? And maybe my wife and kids and, and grandchildren will say, he was a man, he was a husband, a father, a grandfather, a pastor. Maybe they'll say he liked coffee, music, drawings, being creative, playing sports and stuff like that. Uh, maybe they'll say that I believed in Jesus was the Christ. I don't know. I won't be there, right? But what I hope they would say, let's say that Mark was like Christ. The Mark was loving. The Mark was forgiving. The Mark was nonviolent. The Mark loved all people. 
That Mark was there for them. That Mark would go looking for them if they were lost. And there was nothing that would keep Mark from, you know, loving them or, or, or you know, expressing the, the, the love for Christ. That would be the best way to explain that Jesus was the Christ. But I'm seeing I'm using this concept of the Christ, and we stop and we see in Scripture. Um, and we stop and examine, you know, the, this identifications you put on your paper and stuff like that. And I'm looking for your identity or who you are in Christ and how we can share the world. Because our, our mission, our, our sort of place and you know, our desire as we become, you know, in this world, lights in a dark world, is to share the identity of Christ and share the truth, the hope. And, and when I stop and read the news and you look at the floods that are happening, and, and incidentally, I, I thought it's interesting because... Um, they would say, you know, like Fort McMurray was the worst fire 100 years or something like that. And then this flood before was like the 100th year, you know. And now they're saying it's like the thousandth year, you know. No one's ever seen a flood like that. And even on the Bible, which I thought was quite interesting, is or on, on the, the news, sorry, Global National, they said uh, of the, the flood of uh, biblical proportions, which I thought was very interesting because I don't know if these commentators even know, read the Bible, number one, or two, believe the Bible. But you can see that, you know, sort of biblical proportion. Like, what does it, doesn't make any sense if you don't believe the Bible. It's like, you know, saying this was of Harry Potter proportions. Like, it doesn't make any sense. But our world is still, you know, kind of expressing things that's happening. And we're going to see that more and more. You know, it talks about, you know, in the end days, we'll see, you know, every week or something, we're getting terrorist stories and stuff like that. And then with fires up here and floods and all these things. And you talk to people at, at you know, work or, you know, you're, uh, fellow uh, office mates or your family or your neighbors and stuff like that. You people that are kind of going, wow, like, what's happening? What's going on? This world is crazy. And the world is crazy. And I'd hope that we can share to say, yeah, it is. Let's sit down and talk about the identity of the Christ, somebody who came to give us truth, somebody who gave us the word, something we can base our lives on and a hope for the future. And, and you can sail through watching all these terrible news stories thinking that God's got a plan for humanity. There's something more deeper, you know, there's something more aspiring to, not just destruction and, oh boy, it's scary. You know, how can I save myself? How can I be, you know, the empire that just pushes everyone down and I'm okay, I've got power, right? See, Christ came as the Christ, somebody who was um, not about power, but about love, you know, and that is... Such a precious message that the world needs right now and will continue to need. And, you know, we've been chosen to share that. And we're children of God to share that, you know, with other people. And uh, I think it's a wonderful opportunity. And I hope that we can, you know, make an attempt to share that and to feel that. Because the world wants it. The world needs it. And, of course, the deaf ears, you know, they think you tell them all that stuff and it goes in one ear or out the other. You know, and, and that's, you know, not, it's God's prerogative when they want to open their minds. But, you know, we still have the ability to share with people. Um, I know I, I keep sharing with the one guy. He's 70 years old, still working. He comes to work because I think he, he likes sort of hanging out with people and, you know, whatever. He's not ready for retirement or whatever. But, you know, he says, you're a very weird person, Mark. You know, you're very odd, you know. Like, one woman, you don't look at other women. You stay married. You're happily married. You go to church. You want to do good. It's like, you're weird. Like, you're, what is that? And, and when they stop and talk, and then it's like, your thoughts are really you know, whoa. And, and, and I don't come across as, you know, saying, so he's, apparently he was born as Hindu, became a Muslim, and then he says, well, I want to come to your church so I can at least have, a, you know, another option when it gets bad, right? Collect all the things to be saved. And, and I have a very simple discussion with him when we share and stuff. And, and there's a friendship built, you know, he says, I really, I like talking with you, you're very interesting, right? And, and what I think he sees, obviously I'm a funny guy, but I think he sees more than that. He sees, you know, that I have hope, I have, you know, some truth. And, I, and you speak the scripture, and it's like, wow. Like, people, they can tell, you know, truth is very, very powerful. And at some points they just say, ah, you're, you're just silly, or, you know, they just push it aside. But at other points you get this kind of twinkle, ding, really, wow. And that's, that's what we can do to people. We can share with people like that. And, uh, and I do hope that, you know, we can find opportunities to, anywhere, you know, just be open about our faith and, and, and share with people, because the world really desires that. They seek that. They want to know somebody uh, like the Christ who came. So with that, we'll end in prayer.
Almighty Father in heaven, Father, we're so thankful that uh, you came to the earth. You came as uh, a human, son of man. We've discussed that today, what it means, and uh, uh, like a vision, a new vision for humanity, a new vision of what you're doing with humanity. Uh, you died on the cross, and you, you know, showed us that the resurrection, and you were there, seated by the Father. And uh, that our, our hope and our future is in that resurrection. It's in that new identity, that new uh, spiritual living, that you know, kingdom living, uh, being with you and establishing that. And we, we were thankful for that. We talked about that, and we, we know that. We're so wonderful to have that, that you shared that with humanity. You came for us, or else we'd be lost. But right now we pray for a chance to share with the world, people that are neighbors, our family, our friends, and anybody around us, that we can share that vision, we can share that hope, because the world truly is hungry. We just pray that we can you know, be in their lives in a real way. We thank you for all these things, and uh, we bless our time as we in fellowship. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Oh, yeah. Okay, brethren, let's close services with one final hymn. I keep telling Pastor Mark not to use my name in his sermons. All it does is, I said to him, it just doesn't help your credibility at all. <laughs> anyway, let's continue. Where's our one final worship song before we all gather for lunch? Thank you.